Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. In this video, we're gonna be breaking down the 15 different streams of income that me and the business as a whole made in 2021. Now, before we get started, I wanna give the usual caveats. The point of this video is absolutely not to flex. I'm a big fan of openness and honesty and transparency when it comes to this sort of stuff. And I've actually benefited a lot in the past from other people on the internet being open and honest about their revenue numbers. And anytime I do one of these videos, I get a barrage of comments and messages and emails from people saying that, oh my God, this video has been incredible. It's inspired me to start my own creator journey, to start a YouTube channel, start a podcast, start that business that I've been dreamed I've been dreaming of doing for a while but there always seem to be like two categories of objections from a vocal minority about these sorts of videos number one category of objection is that like oh my god I can't believe you're talking about this stuff that's such an arrogant thing to do don't you realize that people have lost their jobs in the pandemic and the world is struggling and here you are talking flexing about how much money you've made I get it if you're in that camp of people and you think this video is a flex and you think it's going to negatively affect your mental state or anything like that please don't watch the video you don't have to I'm not forcing you with your eyes propped open with matches to watch this sort of video and secondly the other caveat is that this is not a get rid quick scheme. I have been doing this internet making money stuff since the age of 13 when I first started making websites on the internet as a freelancer and started to set up various online businesses. I've had a bunch of failures. My first business succeeded like seven years later at the age of around 20. And then slowly over time, as I've built up this YouTube channel and the team around it, it's now got into pretty insane proportions. Keep in mind as well that I now have a team of 17 full-time staff, four or five part-time staff, a bunch of contractors who help with this business as well. So this is not just me and my personal income. I wish that were the case. It's really not. And so please don't think that I'm saying, hey, anyone can do this if you just start a YouTube channel or sign up to my course down below and you too will be able to have this level of success. I'm not saying that at all. All I'm doing is candidly, transparently, and hopefully in an honest kind of way, giving you an insight into what our own business finances look like. And I'll share some of the lessons we've learned along the way in building up these 15 different streams of revenue. And so hopefully that's all my virtue signaling done for the year. So now let's get into the 15, starting with the lowest and coming in at number 15, we have Twitch. Yes, earlier this year, I decided during lockdown that I was gonna get back into World of Warcraft, which was my favorite game when I was growing up. I clocked in about 180 days of play time on World of Warcraft from the ages of about 14 to 17, which ended up being on average about three hours a day of playing World of Warcraft. Anyway, I decided to buy an Alienware gaming PC and decided to become a streamer. And so for a few weeks, I think maybe it was a month or two, I streamed on Twitch. And in that time, I made a grand total of $92.27. By the way, for this video and all the others, I'm using dollars because that's a currency that more people understand than the great British pound, even though I am based in the UK and therefore all this stuff is actually in pounds. Anyway, I made $92.27 off of Twitch streaming um, and streamed for 24 hours and two minutes. So that's an hourly rate of about $3 per hour. And bearing in mind the gaming PC I was using for this cost about 3000 something. It was like very, very ROI negative, but hey, it was fun. And I learned some stuff along the way and decided maybe I'll get back into streaming at some point. But yeah, Twitch comes in at number 15 and we've got $92.27. Coming in at number 14, we have my day job working as a doctor. So as some of you know, this year I didn't work very much as a doctor. I was on my one year sabbatical for medicine. And very recently I decided that I actually wasn't gonna go into it. But this year I did a couple of part-time shifts in the emergency department. So I worked around eight hours for each of those shifts. There were two shifts and I made 30 pounds per hour, which is 480 pounds in total, which is around about $640. That one was personal income, obviously, rather than business income but that takes our grand total now to $732.27. In position 13, we have the fact that I was a mentor for the Building a Second Brain online course, which is run by my friend Tiago Forte. He very kindly asked me to be a mentor this year. I was also a mentor last year. And the uh, stipend that you get paid for being a mentor on the course is $1,000. Honestly, I wasn't doing it for the money. I was doing it because it's fun and I love the community and Building a Second Brain is a fantastic course, which changed my life when I first took it way back in 2019. That takes our total of personal and business income in aggregate to $1,732.27 for the year. Coming in at number 12, we have real estate. So in the first half of the year, from January to August, I was living with a housemate. Her name is Sheen. She has a YouTube channel linked down below. And Sheen was a lodger in the flat that me and my brother own. And we were charging her £625 in rent, which is the tax-free threshold. So that comes out to around about $835 every month for like eight months. But on top of that, pretty excitingly, I closed on two buy to let properties in Manchester. So I now have these two flats that have tenants in them who are paying me rent. That only started a couple of months ago. And so in total, by the end of the year, I would have made $3,068 from rental income on these rental properties. Obviously, there are tons and tons of expenses going into this. And I will do a video which is coming out very soon on how much money I spent in 2021. So you can get an idea of the balancing act here. But in this video, we're just talking about the input side of the equation. And that brings our total to $5,000. 
$1,635.27. Oh, and if you're interested in seeing what these properties are, I actually have a vlog about this on my second channel. It's called Ali's Appendix, if you didn't know. That'll be linked in the video description if you want to check it out for whatever reason. Coming in at number 11, we have Nebula. Now, if you don't know, Nebula is an independent streaming platform that's owned by me and a bunch of other creators, and it's built by our agency, which is called Standard, which is absolutely lovely. I freaking love it. And the way Nebula works is that it's sort of like Spotify streaming royalties in that people subscribe to Nebula, and then the creators get a cut of that based on their total watch time. So actually this year, I have in total made $6,478 on Nebula, excluding November and December, because we haven't added those up yet. And that brings our grand total to $12,113.27. Coming in at number 10, we have sponsorship streams on the podcast. So I actually have two different podcasts. One is called Not Overthinking, which is a weekly-ish podcast that I do with my brother, where we just have a chat about stuff. We've been a bit inconsistent with it over the, this last year. Anyway, this year, the podcast made around $7,250 in overall sponsorship fees. But also, very excitingly, a few months ago, I launched a second podcast, we and the team did, uh, called a Deep Dive, or Deep Dive with Ali Abdal, which is like an in-person, mostly interview podcast where I interview entrepreneurs, creators, and other inspiring people about their kind of stories and how they got to where they are and how they find fulfillment in work and life and how they like live a good life in terms of health, wealth, love, and happiness, those four pillars that make a good life. That's been really fun to do. I've interviewed a ton of really cool people. There'll be a link to the Deep Dive podcast YouTube channel and stuff in the video description if you want to check it out. If you haven't heard yet, I think we've got like 10 episodes out so far, something like that, can't remember. But either way, this year so far, the podcast has brought in $19,500 in sponsorship fees. So that's pretty sick. The podcast still is very much losing money because we have like a full-time person on our team called Amber, who's responsible for making the podcast happen, for producing it. We also have our team of editors that uses some of their time on the podcast and our social media team using some of their time on the podcast to repurpose the content. But actually, to be honest, for the podcast, we don't really need to worry about making money on it because thankfully the rest of the business makes enough money and then it can kind of fund the podcast as a bit of a passion project because it's just genuinely really fun for me to interview these cool people. I get to make friends with them and then you guys get to listen in completely free to those conversations. So that's been, that's been super fun. Anyway, with the podcast, that takes our overall revenue for this year to $55,223.20. All right, coming in at number nine, we have stocks and shares and the gains I've made on that. Now this is personal income rather than business income because these accounts are in my personal name, but Obviously in this video, we're aggregating them all, so just keep that in mind. And there's broadly three different buckets in which I invest in stocks and shares. The first one is called Free Trade. Free Trade is an app based in the UK that lets you invest in individual stocks and shares. And I started using Free Trade in around about November, 2020. Now this is what my Free Trade portfolio looks like. At the moment, the portfolio has a value of 34,860 pounds and 65 P, which is something in dollars. I don't know quite, well, quite what off the top of my head. But since I began investing, which was November last year, so around about a year at this time, it's gone up by $14,860.79. And you can have a look at roughly what investments I've personally invested in. So I've personally invested in Tesla, MP Materials, Shopify, Netflix, NASDAQ 100, Etsy, MongoDB, and Fastly. So those are the ones I've, get, I've made money. I, 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 I put 2,000 quid into Fastly and that's gone down by 47%. I put 2,000 into Teladoc, that's gone down by 55%. Fiverr is not doing very well. So those were the ones that I have invested in personally. But then all of the other shares I get are actually because I have a free trade affiliate link thing, which anyone can get if they sign up to the platform. And anytime someone signs up with that link, both me and that person get free shares. And so occasionally throughout the year, I just mention this link on Instagram as like a swipe up or as an Instagram sticker. And hundreds of people, probably maybe even thousands of this one, no, probably hundreds, hundreds of people based in the UK sign up to free trade, we both get a free share. And so a bunch of the gains I've made from this <laughs> have actually been through these free shares that all these various people have very kindly given me. Now I've been using free trade to dabble with individual stocks investing, but I think if you exclude the fact that I've got a bunch of these free shares from actually having an audience and people signing up to this thing, I think I've actually lost money overall when it comes to investing in individual shares. And this speaks to the general point that I tell everyone, which is that generally you shouldn't bother investing in individual stocks unless you are very lucky or unless you managed to invest in, I don't know, Apple or Amazon or Tesla or something ages ago. Generally, you shouldn't try and invest in individual stocks. Instead, you should try and invest in broad stock market index funds like the S&P 500. And that is the index fund that tracks the top 500 companies in the US. And so for a small percentage of my portfolio, I dabble with individual stocks just because it's kind of fun. But I know that that's not really how I'm going to make money. And the way I make money is over time by putting all the rest of my money in stocks and shares into the S&P 500. And so there's two different platforms that I use for this. The first one is called Vanguard. That's the one I've been using most recently. Vanguard is a huge platform that anyone can use. And I've got two accounts with Vanguard. I've got a tax efficient ISA individual savings account. I think that's what it stands for. And I have got a less tax efficient uh, general investment account. So if we look at these numbers overall in the ISA, I contributed 20,000 pounds, which is the maximum that you can do in each financial year in the UK. I started with 46K. My investments returned me 12,000. So I made 12,000 pounds of free money that's completely tax free by virtue of the fact that I put money into this ISA. And I ended up the year with 78,274 pounds, which is a total gain of 12K. Then we have the general investment account. So what I do here is that I just have a 500 pounds every month, just a standing order that just automatically puts money into 
into my general investment account and buys 500 pounds worth of the S&P 500 again. And so overall I contributed 6,000. The investments overall returned 16,000 because I already had 60,000 in the account. And so in the general investment account, I ended up with 82,909 pounds and 52p. Anyway, the second account I use is called Charles Stanley Direct. That's another platform. And that's what I initially used for the first few years of putting money into the ISA. That has an overall value of 133,000 pounds. And overall I've put in 76,379. So actually, because I started investing this in like around about 2015 to 2018. So in that time I put in about 76K, 2018 to 2015 to 2019. And I've made like 57,000 pounds of free money by just putting money in this thing and forgetting about it in this tax-free wrapper that's called an ISA based in the UK. And that brings our grand total to $132,529.23. Alrighty, coming in at number eight, we have my book publishing deal. So I have a deal with Penguin UK to publish the book, which has been a thing for quite a while. But also recently we've had a deal from a US publisher. I'm not sure to what extent I'm allowed to talk about these. I asked my agent and she said, it's okay to say that these were six figure book deals, um, but we don't wanna give any more specifics about that. So let us, let's base the rest of these calculations on the fact that these are six figure book deals. There were two of them, so that can be number eight and number seven in terms of this tally. Also because I kind of lost count of the numbers and ended up with 14 rather than 15. So this will make, this will make it 15. So eight and seven is two six figure book deals um, from Penguin and I think an undisclosed pub publisher right now at some point it'll be announced. I'm not sure what the deal with that is. I'm just kind of letting letting the agent handle all the book deal type things. And at the same time, we're also like selling the tra foreign translation rights to the book that I'm currently in the process of failing to write. We're selling the foreign translation rights to those books in to the book in all these multiple territories like Germany and France and Korea and mainland China and uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, those sorts of areas. And so every few weeks I'm getting emails from my agent being like, oh, we have an offer from this new territory for the book and this is how much it's for. What do you reckon? And I'm like, yeah, let's go for it. Um, I'm Again, I'm not sure to what extent I'm actually allowed to talk about this stuff. I will be very, very open and transparent about it at some point. I just don't know how the publishing industry works and I don't want to piss anyone off because this is my first time writing a book. So we will say that number eight and seven on this list is two six-figure book deals. Let's assume six figures, minimum six figures is $100,000. And so that is $200,000 in total. And that brings our total figure of streams of revenue to be $332,000. 529.23. All right, coming in at income stream number six, and this is personal rather than business again, is crypto. Yes, I first started investing in crypto in September of or August of 2017, and I started by investing 400 pounds, but then gradually, gradually, gradually across 2017, I ended up putting large amounts of money in crypto so that by the end of 2017, or rather by January 2018, I had put in 66,237 pounds and 41p. This was while I was a medical student, before I was making money working as a doctor, kind of before I started making money from this YouTube channel, but I did have money from another business that I used to run, helping helping people get into med school. Anyway, I put all my savings from that into crypto. I even sold some of my stocks and shares and put them into crypto because I'm an idiot. And then crypto completely crashed. And then I had to sell a bunch of Bitcoin to be able to afford the house. I ended up actually selling about five or six Bitcoin to put a deposit on the house. And five and six Bitcoin would now be worth about $300,000. But I sold them for about $40,000 to be able to afford the deposit on the flat that me and my brother bought in Cambridge. That's fine, I'm totally over it. But I do have a video up there and linked in the video description that talks about the lessons I learned from losing large amounts of money on Bitcoin. Anyway, throughout crypto winter, as we're now calling it, from 2018 through to 2021, I was very much in the red on crypto. So you can see here, for example, my portfolio was worth 25K, even though I put in 66K, so I'd lost 40,000. And at one point I'd even realized a loss of something like 45,000 pounds. That was pretty mental. But then thankfully in 2021, crypto started to rise again. And that was very cool because when I sold my Bitcoin to buy the flat, I did not sell any Ethereum and I actually held on to 27 Ethereums, ETH, whatever you want to call it, from way back in 2017. And then Ethereum went absolutely mental in 2021. And so now my portfolio is actually worth a decent chunk of money. Right now, according to Cointracker, the total value of the portfolio is 197,864 pounds, which is a gain of 75,000 pounds in its lifetime. But if we calculate the numbers for this calendar year, essentially what that looks like is that I have put in $74,839 of crypto this calendar year. So I've bought lots of Bitcoin and Ethereum, that kind of stuff. And the overall gain from January through to December this year, 2021, has been $132,377. So that's been pretty sick, to be honest. Like it's an overall gain of $132,000 thanks to crypto going on the rise. And if you wanna see what my coin allocation looks like, here is what it looks like. 
Mostly my money is in Ethereum and Bitcoin. I did buy some Litecoin in 2017, which has gone down by 25%. I bought some Cardano, a Cardano a few months ago, thanks to Andre Jick's recommendation. Thank you, Andre, for that. Uh, that's gone up by 3%. Well done, Andre, good, good suggestion there. I bought some Solana a few weeks ago because I was looking into it. I bought some e ENS, Ethereum name service, because I was trying to register a .eth domain name. So I thought, let's buy some ENS tokens. I also lost over 500 pounds on Shiba Inu, and I lost over 500 pounds on Dogecoin. So if there's any Shiba or Doge millionaires watching this video, you have, I, I have been your patsy. I have given you the money that you have made, you have used to make those make those millions. But that's currently what my portfolio looks like. It's kind of fun. These days, to be honest, I'm putting most of my investments into crypto rather than to stocks and shares. And I'll be talking more about those at some point in early 2022, about exactly what my asset all allocation is for the investment portfolio and why I'm very, very bullish on crypto. Anyway, if we add all those numbers up for the crypto gains, our total at this point for the 15 through to six income streams is $464,906.23 for the calendar year so far. Alrighty, now we're getting into the big leagues. We are getting into the top five income streams. So coming in at number five is affiliate income. Now, there are 10 different affiliate people that I am partnered with in various capacities. I'm not gonna break down exactly specifically because I think that would be mean on those affiliate partners, but um, the ones that I've got are TubeBuddy, which is a YouTube add-on, Readwise, which is a really good Chrome extension type thing that helps you sync what you read and the highlights and stuff. Ugmonk, which is a great thing that does physical products like a to-do list and a few other bits that I have on my desk. Epidemic Sound, which is how we use music for this channel. Ghost, which is the website platform and hosting that I've been using since like 2015, 2016. We now have an affiliate deal with Ghost, which is pretty cool. We've got Amazon Associates, which is the world's biggest affiliate program. So anytime I link to stuff in these YouTube videos and I use an Amazon affiliate link, that contributes to the affiliate income. We've got Teachable, which is a platform for online courses. So for example, when I'm an affiliate for things like Building a Second Brain by Tiago Forte and Rite of Passage by my friend David Perel and like the Rome course and the DeFi course by my mate Nat Eliason, these guys all use Teachable for their stuff. And so I get some affiliate revenue through Teachable. We also have the paper-like screen protector for the iPad. I have an affiliate relationship with them since like 2018, which is somewhat profitable. We have IQ Unix that make cool keyboards like the F96, which is a stable of my desk setup. Nice clicky clacky mechanical keyboard, affiliate relationship with them that some people buy the keyboard through. Thank you for that. And we have short form, which is sort of like Blinkist. It's like really, it's genuinely a really good service that summarizes books into these one page summaries, into these detailed summaries. And I use short form almost every day when I'm trying to read books. And if I need a summary of that book, it's pretty sick. Anyway, in total, these are our 10 kind of top affiliate partners. And the overall affiliate revenue from this calendar year, excluding November and December, because we don't have the numbers for those yet, is $208,201. Over $200,000 from shilling these affiliate products with links in the YouTube video description. This is pretty mental. It's actually pretty fun as well, because like, I genuinely like this shit. Like all of the products that I've mentioned here is stuff that I genuinely use on like a daily slash weekly basis. And it's great because as a YouTuber type person, what I can do is I can just talk about products and I can review them. And then if people buy them and enjoy the product, well, they don't have to enjoy the product, but if people buy the thing using my affiliate link, which is very kind, because they don't have to use my link. They can just go on Google and go on the website, which a lot of people do. But that contributes $208,201 to our top line. So that's pretty sick. So thank you if you've ever bought anything using one of our affiliate links. We will put all of them in the video description if you fancy checking them out, but that's kind of cool. Um, yeah, that is affiliate income at number five. And so overall, our total now looks like $673,107.23. All right, coming in at number four, we have YouTube AdSense revenue. This is the revenue we get from those five second ads that maybe play before this video if you don't have YouTube Premium or if you don't have Adblocker. I have YouTube Premium. I think it's great. Genuinely life-changing, the life-changing subscription. Everyone should have YouTube Premium, but if you don't and you watch those ads and you don't have Adblocker, then thank you because you're contributing some amount of money to our top line. This year, since first of January to the 2nd of December, because I'm filming this on the 3rd of December, we have gotten 74, 74 million views. Thank you, that's cool. 6.2 million hours of watch time, apologies. 1.1 million subscribers and $391,135.30 in revenue. So yeah, broadly, this is what that looks like. RPM means revenue per meal. So for every thousand views that we get roughly on the channel, we get $5.47 worth of revenue. And because we've got 70 million views this year. Yeah, 391135.30. That is pretty sick. In terms of our top earning videos, by far the highest earning revenue video in 2021 is this uh, this nine passive income ideas, how I make $27,000 per week. And this is kind of interesting. I think Graham Stephan calls this the YouTube bullshit industrial complex or something like that, where it's like you make a video talking about money and then you make money from that video. And then you make a video talking about how much money that video made you. I actually haven't done that. I should do, we should do a video called uh, how much YouTube paid me for, I don't know, 5 million views on that video. But that video alone has brought in $103,529. The next one, how to invest for beginners and how to type really fast. How to invest for beginners brought in 22,000. How I type really fast, 11,000. 
How to build a website, Rogue, that's brought in 11,000. And how I manage my time is brought in 9,000. Those are our top five performing videos for 2021. So thank you everyone if you watched one of those videos with ads on. And you can see that as we approach Christmas, kind of in November and December, ad rates get a lot higher than they, they were in the past. So in July, for example, we were at 46K for the month, but in November, we're at 60K for the month. And hopefully in December, we'll be sort of around the 50, 60K mark as well. So that's the main channel. We also have my second channel, which is Ali's Appendix, which this year has made 1,709 pounds and 15p, which someone will convert to dollars like right here. And so overall, if we add up a total AdSense revenue from the main channel and the second channel to date, so excluding the month of December, we've got $372,900 which is kind of cool. And that brings our total to $1,046,000. Uh, How do you even say this number? $1,046,007.23, which is kind of a weird number. But we've broken the million dollar mark and we still have the top three sources of revenue to go. All right, we're now in the top three and coming in at number three, we have sponsorships and brand deals on the main channel. Now I can't tell you specifically what each brand pays because I'm not allowed to do that, but I'm sure no one, no one will mind if I give you an overall number. And that overall number is that so far, this year, we have made $523,000 from various brand deals and sponsorships on this channel. And uh, we have to take 20% off of that because my agency standard, that's the fee that they take. It's a 20% cut. That's pretty normal. It's industry standard across the board for this sort of influencer marketing type agencies. Standard is more than an influencer marketing agency. It's more like a, like a team. Family? Family is probably the wrong word. It's more like a team. It's great. Um, but they take 20%. And that leaves us with roughly $432,000 in top line revenue from sponsorships. So thank you to all our sponsors on the main channel. And that brings our overall total overall total up to $1.478 million. To be honest, these numbers are pretty mental. I, I'm saying this in a, all these numbers in a kind of very matter of fact way because I've sort of been living with these numbers and the more you live with these numbers, the more like they sort of lose their emotional impact. But I remember, you know, the first year of the YouTube channel, it really made zero money. Second year of the YouTube channel, maybe made, made a few thousand. And that number has like kind of exponentially grown over time. And it's similar with all of the streams of revenue in this business that you really get this sort of exponential compounding growth trajectory. And this is true of basically every YouTuber and almost every business that I know of as well, especially that uses the power of internet scale and internet leverage, whereby at the start, you're doing a lot of work to get the flywheel going and you're putting in a lot of time and money and effort and hours, and blood and sweat and tears into making these videos. Hopefully you're enjoying the journey along the way. And then at some point, the flywheel gets turning and then it starts to get to a point where you start to make just absurd amounts of money from this sort of stuff. There are people who are making tons more money than I am on YouTube. Like it's just like I've, I've seen some of the balance sheets of some YouTuber friends and it's just like absolutely insane. And I, and I think there is still so much opportunity there for other people to start YouTube channels. Like even if you were to start a YouTube channel in 2022, there has been no better time to be a YouTuber than now. Because yes, most niches are kind of saturated. But also at the same time, the algorithm is very tuned. People know what the deal with YouTube is. There's so, there's so much money in the space from AdSense and from brand deals and from being able to sell your own products. There's so much you can do with YouTube that if you can genuinely create videos that people want to click on and that people want to watch and do this consistently over a very long period of time, then you can probably not easily, but you know, it's, it's fairly simple to understand what it takes to make a good YouTube video. And provided you're entrenched in the space, like I've been for the last four and a half years, you probably will have some level of traction. And we've had a bunch of students from a part-time YouTuber Academy who have had like some level of financial success already, even within a few months to one year, because we ran the cohort a year ago, uh, that's been like a life-changing thing for them by virtue of the fact that they're trying to make these videos and consistently put them out once a week. So I still genuinely think there's all to play for in the YouTube thing. Yes, the best time to start a YouTube channel was probably 10 years ago, but the second best time is now. It's like planting a tree. Best time to plant a tree is 10 years ago, but the second best time is right now. Anyway, moving on to number two. At number two, we have our favorite Skillshare. Yes, Skillshare. Skillshare makes us a decent chunk of money because I have about 10 something, uh, somewhere between eight and 10 online classes at Skillshare. Now Skillshare is kind of like Netflix and it's also kind of like Spotify. So it's kind of like Netflix in that people pay a monthly subscription, like $10 a month or something to sign up to a Skillshare premium account. I pay for it, I have a Skillshare premium account, it's good. And that gives you unlimited access to all the courses on Skillshare. But it's kind of like Spotify because the way that us, the teachers get paid is that for every minute of watch time that someone with a premium membership has, Skillshare pays us like somewhere between three, four, five, six, seven cents per minute of watch time. It kind of varies month to month depending on what the membership fees are. And they're very open and transparent about this whole process. It's all on the website if you want to check it out. On top of that, Skillshare also have their own affiliate program, which we've not included in our affiliate revenue because it's sort of like Skillshare is kind of its own thing, the way we think about it in the business. And it's a really interesting program because anytime a teacher or me, any anytime I refer someone to sign up to a free trial of Skillshare, Skillshare pays me $10 
even if that person doesn't continue their free trial. So actually there's probably a bunch of people that have taken free trials of Skillshare to take my classes, which you can do if you want, links in the video description. And then they've probably canceled their trials or they haven't, or they've, they've kept it going. I don't know what the stats are on those, but either way, Skillshare pays $10 for that. And that's interesting because clearly to Skillshare, it is ROI positive for them to have this customer acquisition cost of $10 through this affiliate program, even if someone doesn't actually pay for the whole subscription. Anyway, here is the table of what we've earned from January through to October of 2021. You'll see the royalties tab that fluctuates between 55 to about $74,000 per month, which is completely absurd. And that is through probably lots and lots and lots of people watching my eight to 10 classes at Skillshare and hopefully enjoying them and leaving good reviews for them. And then the total earned is what you get when you add up the royalties and the affiliate stuff as well. And so if we look at these numbers, which are absolutely insane, it means that this year in total so far, excluding November and December, we have made $716,691 from Skillshare. And therefore that brings our running total to 2 million one hundred and ninety-four thousand. $698.23. This 23 cents is a bit bizarre because obviously these numbers are like a little bit of a, a simpl simplification at this point. But yeah, two, almost $2.2 million and we are yet to do our number one income stream. Again, these numbers are absolutely mental. Like I first started on Skillshare because a friend of mine showed me some of his stats and he was making like $2,000 a month from it. And I was like, oh my God, $2,000 a month. That's like a life-changing amount. If I, if I could have an extra $2,000 a month coming in through Skillshare, that would like completely explode what, what I'm able to do. I might be able to hire someone. This was before I actually hired hired a team. Now, like we look at these numbers and it's like, you know, 64,000, 65,000, $75,000 per month just off of Skillshare. And we actually don't really promote the Skillshare courses very much. I occasionally mention them in videos. They occasionally sponsor, sponsor a video or two and we just have the links in the video description. But actually it's, it's really interesting as a platform because a bunch of people have actually found this YouTube channel through Skillshare. Like I've had a few emails from people being like, I discovered you because I saw your Skillshare class on Stoicism or I discovered you because I saw your productivity Skillshare class. And I'm like, oh, wow. I didn't realize that actually Skillshare had that amount of reach but it's kind of cool because Skillshare has had investment recently. It's been growing as a platform. It's genuinely good. If I genuinely need to learn something and I can't find a video on YouTube, I will find a course on Skillshare and it's generally pretty sick. So yeah, Skillshare, great stuff all around and just an absolutely absurd amount of money to be making just from this single platform alone. And finally, we come to income stream number one and that is the part-time YouTuber Academy. So in November of 2020, at the time I had a team of four people-ish. So it was me, I was, I was in the business full-time because I'd quit being a doctor at that point. We had Christian, who was our full-time editor in Romania. We had Angus, who was our full-time like writer slash everything. And we had Elizabeth, who was my part-time personal assistant at the time. And in around about October of 2020, um, I had the idea that, hey, we should do a course for YouTubers. Initially, it was gonna be a course that was gonna be a self-paced thing that we were gonna charge a few hundred dollars for and just put it up, kind of similar to a Skillshare class. But then I spoke to my friends, Tiago Forte and David Perel, who have run their own cohort-based courses. And they strongly advised me to reconsider and to run the Part-Time YouTuber Academy as a cohort-based course. By the way, shout out to Elizabeth for actually coming up with the name Part-Time YouTuber Academy. It used to be called the Infinite Content Engine before that, which was just objectively a worse name. Anyway, Tiago and David told us to run it as a cohort-based course. And so within a few weeks, me and Angus had put together the slides and the course material and all that kind of stuff. And we posted on Twitter saying, hey, we're doing this thing, who wants to join? And honestly, I was expecting somewhere between 10 and 20 people to join. And I was expecting this to be a beta validation cohort. Let's run it once as a live cohort, see what happens. And then maybe we'll just pre-record it so we can get some feedback. But that first cohort in late 2020, we had about 350 people sign up. And this year, this calendar year, we've run cohort two, cohort three, and cohort four of the course. And we've managed to teach over a thousand students and we've got like some pretty amazing reviews. We have a very liberal money back guarantee where basically the rule is that if you take the course and you genuinely do the work, like you finish the homework assignments, and if you, if you don't get value from the course, you can just email us and we will give you your money back. It, out of the thousand or so students that we've had, I think we have had two people who have, he, who have emailed us and actually taken advantage of this refund policy. Like they've done the work and they've asked for their money back because they didn't like the course. Two people out of a thousand, that's pretty sick. We've had a few other people, like maybe like somewhere 20, somewhere between 30 and 50 email us asking for refunds for other reasons. Like, you know, life got in the way, they had a kid, they lost their job, all these kind of reasons. And we're very happy to give people refunds for that. But only two people have actually asked for their money back because they thought the course was bad. And that was great because I was so scared of running this course because I was thinking, I don't want to be selling snake oil. I want to make sure that what we have to sell is valuable and offering such a liberal money, money back guarantee made me feel better about the whole thing. So it's kind of nice that, <laughs> you know, people have gotten enough value from the course. And it's pretty sick. Like we have a whole community around it. People meet up in person. We had a real life event in London a few weeks ago where we met 50 people from the part-time YouTuber Academy cohorts throughout the year. And even like, you know, one of our friends from Chicago came, flew down to London to hang out with PTYA friends. And it's, 
morphed into, like from this random idea that me and Angus had that started on post-it notes, it's become this like ridiculously cool community of over a thousand people that's like helping each other out. We're actually in the middle of running cohort four right now. We're approaching the end of it and we're gonna be running a few more cohorts next year. But let's get to the numbers. In cohort two, um, we capped it at 200 places. And so we made a revenue of $649,151. Cohort three was a few months later. I think we had 400 places there. That was $902,070. And cohort four, which we're in the middle of at the moment, was $1,044,085. 104,085. Again, these numbers are, are absolutely insane. And if you told me even a year ago that we would have, you know, a new business that was made off the back of two weeks of post-it note brainstorming and planning, and it would make $2.5 million in revenue in a single year. I would have had a stroke and a hernia all at the same time because this is just absolutely absurd. This is not what the what the actual kind of take home from this from this is because now the part-time YouTuber Academy is, is its own thing. We've got four full-time team members who are just focused on running the YouTuber Academy. We have a bunch of costs associated with it. We hire a bunch of student supporters and helpers and alumni mentors every time to help with the course, to give detailed feedback to our students. And it's really very much a team effort. So, you know, it's not really my doing. These days I show up and I teach for somewhere between six and eight hours a week, but it's really the team, you know, Angus, Elizabeth, Barth, Tommy and Allison, who we have now that makes this thing happen, which is all pretty sick. And it's great for me because I can do the thing that I love, which is to show up and teach and talk to people. And these guys handle all of the ridiculous amount of work that it takes to run the operations behind the scenes of the Academy. So huge shout out to them for that one. Also to Christian and Christian are two editors who like work around the clock to get the videos edited on time for the YouTuber Academy and all the other random bits that go into it. Jakob on our marketing team, Gareth helping with some of the writing. There's just so much stuff that goes into this that is just like behind the scenes. It's, it, 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 it's kind of its own business. Like this, yeah, this makes more money than all the rest of the business combined. Like over 50% of our revenue now comes from the part-time YouTuber Academy, which is a very scary place to be because we're very reliant on this one golden goose to continue doing well. But it's also quite a fun place to be because it's like this thing is a business which is not completely intrinsically tied to my own personal brand. So all in all, the overall revenue of PTYA part-time YouTuber Academy was around about $2.59 million. And that brings us to our grand total of $4,790,000 and something and a small amount. So 4.79 million is our overall revenue for the business, but also for my personal stuff, or if you mash it all up to, to make this make this insane number. Now, if we compare this figure from last year, uh, I did the video last year. Last year, the figure was 1.339 million, uh, roughly. That was a pretty insane number as well. That figure did not include personal investments and things like that, but honestly, I didn't make put that much into personal investment. So maybe it was $1.5 million last year. It's now 4.8 million. So this is roughly a $3.5 million increase compared to last year. Although our revenue has gone up by an absolute mile, our costs have gone up by even more. And so if we look at this overall in the grand scheme of things, it's hard to believe these numbers. And when the numbers get to this kind of absurd level, I kind of stop thinking about them because, because really like, because this is such a big business now and there's so much stuff associated with it, I really don't see the business gains and business finances as being the same as my total amount of money. Like, I feel like if I had seen these numbers a few years ago, I'd have thought, oh my God, I'm a baller, four million in the bank, lol, lol. But that's actually not what's going on because we have large amounts of costs. And really, I see the business entity as being very distinct from me as an individual, which will make sense if you have a business, won't make sense if you don't have a business because you might be thinking, oh, but it's your business at the end of the day and, and, and stuff like, it really does feel very different to how it would feel if it were just me and the team rather than the 20 of us, for example. I think also it's just been a really interesting and fun process scaling up to this point. Most YouTubers would want to do what, you know, probably what's referred to as a sort of lifestyle business where they're just like very highly paid freelancers. Maybe they have a team of one or two people helping them with editing, helping them with the admin and the finances but it's quite rare for YouTubers to kind of build a team of 20 people. I know Linus does it, I know Marquez does it in America, I know a few people in the UK do it as well. I often think about like, was this more fun when we had fewer people? I don't, I don't think it was, like I had a lot of fun when we had fewer people, but also I was doing a bunch of work, burning the midnight oil quite a lot. Didn't really have much of a social life when I was building, building the YouTube channel when it was just me or when it was just a few of us. But now that there are so many of us running things, it's like I can focus on the content and not have to worry about the business side of things, which Angus completely handles. And also it's just generally quite fun. And I think I really enjoy being part of a team. I enjoy coming into the studio and seeing people in person. We have our kind of content brainstorm meetings on a Monday. We have a table reads on a Tuesday. We have all these things, which a few years ago, if you'd told me, you know, this is what being a YouTuber is gonna be like, I wouldn't really have believed it. But I don't know, it's just been a really fun, it's been an adventure. And to be honest, I'm trying not to think too hard about the numbers. Um, one of the things I really worry about is that, hey, you know, we are making hay while the sun shines. We've got this golden goose. We've got the YouTuber Academy. We've got Skillshare going well. We've got the YouTube channel going well. But what if it all crumbles down? One of the things that keeps me up at night is that this sort of feels a bit like a house of cards that could come crumbling down at any moment. And I sort of feel 
that we've very much lucked out in getting to this point. Yes, there was lots of work involved, especially from the part-time YouTuber Academy team who are kind of work tirelessly to make that happen. But it was a lot of it was kind of being in the right place at the right time. I happened to go to Cambridge, I happened to be a medical student, I happened to be trading off that particular brand value. You know, I was speaking to one of my coaches about this and he was saying that kind of being a YouTuber, you, you can kind of think of it as being an athlete where athletes know that they have a few years to make a lot of money while they're in their prime, but there's absolutely no guarantee that they will continue to make that sort of money once they kind of retire or once they get beyond their prime. And the concern with having a business that's, that's so reliant on YouTube is, what if people don't like my content anymore? I don't think YouTube as a platform is gonna die. Like, you know, I, I don't really see a world in which that's happening with any reasonable probability. But I do think it's a higher probability thing that people will just stop caring about my content. And if that happens, and given that this is sort of a pyramid model where it's like, you know, the, the bottom of the pyramid is what everything else is resting on. And that bottom of the pyramid is like me and the YouTube channel. <laughs> And so if people stop watching that, then everything downstream of that, you know, even though we've got all these like 15 different streams of income, everything downstream of them, that, that we will kind of die. So that's a real concern. So I don't know, like what I'm trying to do moving forward is to just really not think about the numbers, to not think about the money, to focus on the mission, which is, you know, how do I focus on trying to live a good life and documenting the journey along the way in terms of health, wealth, love, and happiness so that if anyone cares to follow the journey along, then they can learn along with me as well. And I like to consider myself a it kind of it's sort of it's going to sound a bit grandiose, but it's sort of like a lifelong student. Like I want to learn the stuff. I read books all the time. I listen to podcasts and stuff quite a lot to try and figure out this thing of hey, how do we live a good, meaningful, fulfilled life? And it's just kind of cool to be able to make videos documenting that journey along the way. I don't really see myself as a guru. I mean, people say, oh, you're a productivity guru, but it's like uh, I, I I just feel that I read a lot of other people's stuff and then I make videos about it because it's kind of fun. But yeah, trying very hard not to think about the numbers. We worked with a business coach recently and he was saying, what's your like three year vision? What's your 10 year target? And really like my 10 year vision is I want to have a profitable business that helps people while having fun. And that's the only thing I care about. Like I, I'm trying very hard not to care that the numbers have to keep going up. The numbers have to be, keep being exponential. But maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm bullshitting myself. Maybe there is a level at which like if the numbers dip next year, I'd be thinking, oh my God, what's going on? Things, things are bad. But right now we're on a growth, tra growth tra trajectory. And I remember with my first business, SixMed, which helped people get into med school, it was really fun for the first three or four years while things were growing. But then in year four or five, things started to plateau and started to, started to dip. And all of a sudden, the fact that things were decreasing sucked the joy out of it. And even though I was doing the same thing, it just sort of felt like a real slog because things were declining. And I'm really scared that that's gonna to happen to the YouTube channel at some point. Who knows? It's fine, we're trying not to think about it. It's not all doom and gloom. It's been pretty fun so far. And yeah, I'm trying not to think about numbers and focus on enjoying the journey and focus on making videos like this one where I can just be fully upfront and honest about how I'm feeling, what the business finances are like. Hopefully you've learned some lessons from this. Hopefully maybe it maybe inspired you to like do your own creative side hustle if you've been thinking about it for a while and haven't gotten around to it yet. Obviously, again, the, the caveat, I've been doing this shit for like 14 years now, so please don't think this is overnight success levels. And also, to be honest, like how much money I make is only a part of the story. Really, revenue is a vanity metric. The thing that matters is profit, and that is revenue, how much money I make, minus how much money we spend. And we spend a large, large, large amount of money to make this YouTube channel and this whole business and the part-time YouTuber Academy. We spend ridiculous amounts of money to make this, this kind of stuff happen. And so check out this video over here, which will appear in the next couple of days if you're watching this like soon, um, exactly how much money I spend. Or alternatively, if you don't care about that and, you, and if you wanna learn the life lessons that I've learned this year, the 21 life lessons I've learned in 2021, check out that video over there. But yeah, thank you so much for watching. Really hope you enjoyed this video. I've lost my voice now and I will hopefully see you in the next video. Bye-bye.